Good afternoon and welcome to Talks at Google in Cambridge, Massachusetts, both to the people here in the room and to everyone joining us via live stream. Today it's my enormous pleasure to introduce Adrienne Mayer. Professor Mayer is here to discuss her landmark new book, Amazon's Lives and Legends of Warrior Women Across the Ancient World. This is the first comprehensive account of warrior women in myth and history across the ancient world from the Mediterranean Sea to the Great Wall of China. Reading it, I'm not sure which is more thrilling, the stories of the women she makes come alive for us or the scholarly rigor she brings to her work. This is really an exceptional book. Please buy it and read it. Professor Mayer is an independent folklorist slash historian of science who investigates natural knowledge contained in pre-scientific myths and oral traditions. Her research looks at ancient folk science precursors, alternatives, and parallels to modern scientific methods. She is research scholar, classics and history and philosophy of science at Stanford. Stanford is lucky to have her on faculty and we're fortunate to have her here with us today. Please join me in welcoming Adrian Mayer. Thank you. Thank you. I'm really honored to be invited to present my research uh, here at Google, and I want to thank women at Google for uh, sponsoring my talk and everyone else who made my visit possible today. Well, Amazon seemed to be everywhere these days. First there was Xena, Warrior Princess, then the animated films Mulan, Brave, Hunger Games, uh, Atalanta and the recent Hercules film, the Shield Maidens and the Vikings, the powerful women in Game of Thrones, and now Marvel Comics has actually introduced a female Thor war, war goddess, and Wonder Woman is uh, actually poised to make a comeback. I hear that she's going to have her own movie in 2017. And meanwhile, <laughs> Women of all ages, uh, we've been talking about this earlier today, are taking up bows and arrows in unprecedented numbers, and horsewomen archers, calling themselves Amazons, are competing around the world. Uh, these are a few of them. You could actually take lessons from these women uh, to learn to do this. Modern Amazons. At the same time, the news from the Middle East is filled with images of an estimated 10,000 women who are serving in the Kurdistan uh, Peshmerga, fighting the Islamic State in Syria, and they're fighting because their very lives depend on victory. So today we're surrounded by images of warrior women. And some 2,500 years ago, the Greeks also surrounded themselves with stories and images of Amazons. The Greeks described Amazons as the equals of men, independent, fearless, foreign horsewomen who gloried in hunting and warfare. And these are just some examples of some Amazon images from uh, Greek art. These are vases from about 550 to 450 BC. And who were the ancient Amazons? In Greek mythology, they were fierce, warrior women of exotic lands, they weren't Greek, they were as courageous and as skilled in battle as the mightiest Greek heroes. Amazons played a major role in the legendary Trojan War, and every Greek, great Greek champion, from Heracles to Theseus and Achilles, they all had to prove their courage by killing a formidable Amazon queen. Greek historians never doubted that Amazons had really existed in the remote, misty past. And many Greek writers reported that women living the lives of Amazons still dwelled in the lands around the Black Sea and beyond the Black Sea in the immense territory that the Greeks called Scythia. Historians and archaeologists still use that word. It's a blanket term, and I'll be using it today. In classical antiquity, Amazons were on view everywhere you looked in Athens and other cities in Greece. They were featured in monumental public sculptures, in mosaics, and in frescoes on public buildings. 
Amazons wearing patterned trousers and boots, riding horses, shooting bows, hurling spears, swinging battle axes, and dying heroically in battle were wildly popular subjects in Greek vase paintings. More than 130 personal names of Amazons still survive from antiquity. They're on statue bases, they're labels on ancient vases, and they are in uh, many ancient texts. Every Greek man, woman, and child knew exciting Amazon tales by art, and little Greek girls, we now know, even played with Amazon dolls. These are just two from the collection in the Louvre. Um, they have, some of them have movable arms and legs, like Barbie dolls. They could be dressed, different costumes. And these were found in little girls' graves from classical Greece. So were Amazons real? Or were bold, warlike women nothing but fantasy figures invented by the Greeks? Were they simply the ancient ancestors of Wonder Woman and Katniss Everdeen? Do we have to think that the exhilarating world of Amazons was just an elaborate fiction brought to life by the Greek storytelling imagination? <coughs> Until now, that is what modern historians had been assuming. But now, thanks to spectacular recent archaeological discoveries across what was once ancient Scythia, we have overwhelming proof that women fitting the descriptions of Amazons in Greek art and literature really did exist. So there were historical counterparts to the mythical Amazons. These women were members of a network of diverse but culturally related nomadic tribes of Eurasia and beyond. Each of those tribes now, of course, they all had their own names, they had their own dialects, languages, and their own histories, but they became known to the Greeks as Scythians, and they all, their cultures were centered around archery and, and riding horses. They were nomads. As nomads, the Scythians left no written histories, so we have to rely on their neighbors and their descendants and on archaeology. Long before modern archaeologists began excavating the graves of real warrior women, the Greek writers had already identified Amazons as Scythians. These warlike tribes have no cities, no fixed abodes, wrote one ancient Greek historian. They live free and unconquered, and they are so savage that even the women take part in war, he wrote. Amazons, remarked others, were as courageous and as fearsome as their Scythian husbands. The nomad women were first described in detail by Greeks in about 470 BC by the Greek historian Herodotus. He and later authors accurately described the Scythian lifestyle and preserved details of their burials in mounds called kurgans on the steppes. And my talk today is going to focus on the evidence from ancient Greek art and modern archaeology. This is a Scythian kurgan. On the left, uh, that's what they look like. They're very large, uh, very complex burials. Um, that one was excavated last year. And uh, you can see the typical uh, finds inside. Among these Scythian nomads, girls learned to ride and handle bows and spears along with their brothers. They knew how to defend themselves, they knew how to hunt, and they knew how to fight just like the men. The lives of those tough nomadic girls and women were so very different from the lives of Greek women in antiquity. In Greece, women and girls were confined indoors to weave and mind children. And that difference, the two cultures made a deep impression on the Greeks. Rumors and descriptions of these horse riding men and women much feared for their deadly arrows and their expanding conquests across Eurasia, began to filter back to Greece, perhaps in the Bronze Age. And the Greeks first began to directly contact these people um, in the 7th century BC. And that's when the Greek cities began to establish trading colonies around the coast of the Black Sea. And it's easy to understand, then, how genuine knowledge mixed with garbled details, intriguing travelers' reports, curiosity, imagination, and a lot of speculation to fill in the gaps 
fired up the Greek imagination and led to an outpouring of exciting stories and vivid pictures of Amazons. And we now know about these people because of archaeological excavations of more than a thousand ancient Scythian graves from the Ukraine, southern Russia, the Caucasus region, and Central Asia. Now before the advent of DNA testing, it used to be taken for granted that any time you found human remains buried with weapons, it was assumed they belonged to a male warrior. And that was just taken for granted. That was routine. But scientific analysis is calling all of those assumptions into question. And there have been some spectacular reversals of previous discoveries announced as male warriors. I'll just give a few examples. In the 1960s in ancient Thrace, that's now Bulgaria, two grave mounds from the fourth century BC, that's uh, the, time, the time when Greeks were telling stories about Amazons. Um, those mounds were discovered in the 60s. And each mound had many weapons, armor. They were filled with gold and silver artifacts and richly equipped horses. A pair of human skeletons lay inside each of those mounds. And these remains were announced as two powerful male warriors who were buried with their wives. 50 years later, in 2010, DNA tests were finally carried out. And the results revealed that all four of the skeletons in those two mounds belonged to women. Another stunning discovery of a warrior woman was reported just last month. I think it's in uh, this month's issue of Archaeology magazine. Um, since the 1970s, when the magnificent tomb of Alexander the Great's father, Philip II, was excavated in Macedonia, archaeologists have wondered about the identity of the mysterious second person, another person's remains buried in the other golden casket next to Philip's. You see the two caskets here. A pair of gilded bronze greaves, greaves, leg armor, shin guards, um, are shown on the right there. And there was a fabulous golden quiver. You see the golden quiver uh, on the lower left, um, along with arrows and parts of a bow. Those weapons posed a puzzle to the archaeologists, because those weapons are not Greek weapons. They're not Macedonian weapons. Those are typical Scythian weapons, like those used by the Amazons in Greek art. And even more curious, if you take a look at those greaves, the shin guards, they're mismatched. They're not the same size. Well. Scientific analysis of those mystery bones was just uh, taken out, uh, taken, uh, taken a few uh, weeks ago. And the analysis revealed surprising news. The Scythian bow and the quiver and those mismatched leg armor, they belonged to a woman. She was about 32 when she died in 336 BC. Her bones showed the rigors of constant horseback riding. One of her legs had broken and had healed crookedly, leaving her with a probably with a limp. And the uneven greaves had obviously been custom made for her. Now, who was this real life Amazon buried in the royal Macedonian tomb with, with uh, the king of Macedon? Theories about her identity are being debated as we speak. We can go into that later if you have questions. Now that DNA. Analysis, analysis is available. It's very expensive, but it is available now. We have more than 300 graves of battle-scarred women buried with their weapons, um, and more are being found every year. And archaeologists are now going back to previously discovered male warriors to see whether those might be women. The biggest concentration of warrior women's burials are in Bulgaria, Romania, Ukraine, southern Russia, the Caucasus, and Kazakhstan, the very places that were identified as prime Amazon territory by the ancient Greeks. In the Scythian Kurgans, warrior women were buried, they could be buried alone, along with other warrior women, or with male warriors. They were always buried as equals. Archaeology shows that the Scythian women were laid to rest with the same honors as the men. There was evidence of large funeral feasts by the mourners, lots of sacrificed horses. The women, like the men, were buried with tools, weapons, golden treasures, 
personal kits for smoking hemp and food for the afterlife, a cup of fermented mare's milk, and a chunk of horse meat impaled by an iron knife on a wooden platter. Bioarchaeology and DNA can reveal the sex, the health, the age at death with more than 90% accuracy now. The DNA results tell us that a substantial number, about 25 to nearly 40% of Scythian women were active warrior women buried with their weapons when they died. Many of those armed women had war injuries like the male warriors. The typical grave goods of the women warriors in the heart of ancient Amazon territory included iron spears, massive armored belts, leather and gold quivers, filled with bronze arrows, bronze swords, battle axes, shields, necklaces of beads and animal claws, golden earrings, and sometimes even clothing of wool, leather, fur, silk, and hemp has been preserved. The youngest girl warrior ever found, here she is. Oh no, this is uh, the 16-year-old. I don't have a picture of the. The youngest girl warrior ever found was about 10. This one was 16. The youngest ever found was 10 when she died, and she was buried in iron armor with two spearheads, evidence that young children, boys and girls, were trained for battle. Also uh, nearby, this was in the Ukraine, nearby another Kurgan or grave mound held the remains of three young girls. They were aged 10 to 15, and their arsenal included heavy cavalry items, scaled armor, helmets, spears, shields, quivers full of arrows. And those girls also owned tools, gold necklaces, and bronze mirrors. Three of the most ancient, the earliest Amazon graves were found in the southern Caucasus region, a land strongly associated with the Amazons in antiquity. The women's skeletons were buried by their companions about 3,000 years ago in 900 BC. One woman was about 30 when she died. She was interred in a sitting position with her bronze sword across her knees and a dagger and a spear at her feet. There's the original report on the left there. The jawbone of her horse and her shield were nearby. The left side of her skull has a wound from a battle ax that had begun to heal before she died. The second woman in that kurgan had an arrowhead embedded in her skull, and the third woman wore a necklace of lion or leopard claws. The scientific studies of skeletons are yielding some very striking results and details. Some women's legs were bowed from a lifetime on horseback. These were nomads who traveled great distances by horse. They suffered arthritis. They had broken bones, probably from constant riding and falls. Some women's hand bones actually reveal evidence of repeated heavy use of a bow. Typical battle wounds of women buried with weapons include ribs slashed by swords, arrowheads embedded in bones, and skulls punctured by pointed battle axes. There's some examples. Pointed battle axes are typical weapons of Amazons in Greek vase paintings. By careful analysis of the bones, bioarchaeologists can often determine the direction of an opponent's attack. They can tell whether the blows occurred while someone was fighting face to face, on foot, on the ground, or on horseback, whether they were in motion when the blow was delivered, and whether or not they tried to deflect the blow. <coughs> Most combat injuries of the women and the men are on the left side, indicating that their adversaries were right-handed. All of this archaeological evidence points to a level of gender equality unheard of among the ancient Greeks. So it's no wonder they were fascinated and horrified by the barbarians of the steppes. Their myths, we can see them as a kind of exciting what-if 
uh, story, pitting these daunting, strong women against the Greeks' own mightiest heroes. Here's Achilles fighting, uh, uh, killing Penthesilea on the, on the battlefield at Troy, and on the right is Heracles uh, killing Hippolyta. He looks a little nervous there in that picture. These images were incredibly popular in antiquity. They're second only to pictures of Heracles. Unlike the restricted lives of Greek girls and women that I explained before, being an Amazon was an option for women on the steppes. Why? Because of a series of unique, extremely successful Scythian technologies and practices, innovations perfectly suited to their time and place. The Scythian way of life, with opportunities for women unheard of in ancient cultures, other ancient cultures, ensured that mounted nomad culture flourished and dominated on the steppes, sweeping over a millennium from Eurasia to China, from about 700 BC to AD 500. In Scythia, young girls were raised to ride horses and shoot bows and arrows, just like their little brothers. And that made perfect sense in a nomadic culture, think about it. Small groups or bands isolated on the harsh, dangerous steps. They're always on the move. They're always facing attack from hostile enemies and other tribes. Everyone, male and female, was a stakeholder, young and old, male and female. They're all uh, expected to contribute, all expected to take part in defense and raids and hunting. On the plane from San Francisco yesterday, it occurred to me that Scythian way of life might be of special interest to Google. And maybe some of you will discern some parallels in, between their world and your world. The Scythians forged an extraordinary combination of sophisticated technologies and unconventional tactics. They were based on agility, flexibility, speed, innovation, shared capacity, shared knowledge, equality, individual merit, also cooperation, teamwork within an extensive network of loosely related groups of rivals as well as potential allies. On the steps, tribes waxed and waned in size and power. Groups were free to split off from the main unit and establish new alliances on their own. Small bands of survivors or rebels might be absorbed into larger tribes or ally with another tribe. The stakes on the steppes were extremely high. Some tribes were decimated, some vanished forever. We have no trace of them. Alliances alternated with hostilities. Former adversaries, however, sometimes united to pursue larger goals of conquest, control over territory, resources, trade. Tribes often coalesced to meet and defeat powerful invading enemies. The Scythians united, for example, in the 6th century BC to defeat the huge Persian army that was led by Darius I. And the Persian king Cyrus the Great actually lost his life fighting the Scythians uh, beyond the, the Caspian Sea. And they were led by the warrior queen Tomiris. Two centuries later, even Alexander the Great's army failed to subdue the Scythians. And the steppe nomads of Inner Asia, the Eastern Scythians held the upper hand over China for several centuries. I think some steppe nomad innovations might have had enough uh, magnitude to qualify as moonshots. Do you still use that word, moonshots? The first great leap forward was the domestication of the horse. The Scythians, or their ancestors, the ancestors of the Scythians, were the first people to ride horses First they domesticated it, then they, re then they learned to ride them. Horses provided food, drink, clothing, agility in battle, speed, and endurance over vast distances. And riding horses required the invention of trousers, essential tailored action wear that zoomed to success 3,000 years ago. Think about it, it's the first tailored clothing. It's interesting that the ancient Greeks actually credited the Amazons with both of those nomad discoveries. 
They, th they said that Amazons were the first to ride horses and the first to wear trousers. Another awesome new technology struck terror into the hearts of their enemies. The nomads of the steppes perfected the small but powerful recurve Scythian bow. Scythian archers were feared for their terrific aim and their ability to shoot arrows at incredible speeds. And then they even went on to concoct sophisticated and nasty arrow poisons by mixing viper venom with pathogens so that you didn't even have to have good aim, just a scratch would kill the enemy. The Parthian shot, the feat of twisting backwards to shoot arrows as one gallops away was another notorious Scythian skill. And they also used a floating anchor, which is uh, an innovation, or not an innovation, but is known nowadays uh, and used by people like, like this modern Amazon of instinctive archery. You don't have a fixed anchor point. You actually use instinctive aim. So you have, it sounds like an oxymoron, but they have a floating anchor. And we see that in the vase paintings of, of Amazons. By now it might be obvious that the crucial uh, uh, change with exponen exponential advantages for the Scythians was the combination of the horse and the bow. The horse combined with archery. That was the great equalizer for women on the steps. Mounted archery was the catalyst for women's full participation in hunting and warfare and all those other activities. Astride a horse with a bow and arrows, a woman could be just as fast and just as deadly as a man. So among the Scythians, women could achieve the same skill sets as the men and become outstanding riders, hunters, and warriors and rise to leadership positions. According to the ancient Greek historians, Scythian women typically formed ad hoc bands, and these bands could either be all women or men and women, and they formed these bands for adventure, for hunting, and war campaigns. We have the names of historical Scythian women who rose to leadership roles and devised strategies and commanded armies. I just mentioned Tamiris was one of them. As the ancient Greeks reported, and as archaeology seems to confirm, young women and girls served as the active duty warriors and raiders, while older women with children could choose to continue that martial lifestyle or not, depending on what they wished and the circumstances. But in emergencies, because everyone had been trained the same, everyone was capable of riding out to meet the enemy. So whether by choice or compelled by circumstances, ordinary women of Scythia could be hunters and warriors. In other words, these foreign women could behave just like ancient Greek men, glorying in physical strength and freedom, roaming at will outside, choosing their own sexual partners, chasing game, and killing enemies. So archaeology, as I mentioned, is shedding new light on the ancient Greek narratives and the artistic representations of Amazons, showing how some details in ancient Greek literature and art that were once dismissed as fantasy or just overlooked altogether now turn out to be accurate representations of steppe nomads' customs and their life and the steppe nomads were the historical counterparts of the mythic Amazons. We're now learning how much the Greeks actually knew, how much they got right, maybe some, sometimes they were guessing, but they knew a lot about real warrior women of Scythia and Scythian technologies and practices, and I think I have time for a few examples. As the Greeks learned more and more about Scythians, they revised their portrayals of Amazons, adding realistic details in written accounts and art. In the fifth century BC, for example, Herodotus, I've already mentioned, the Greek historian, reported that the Scythians enjoyed the intoxicating smoke from burning hemp. As I mentioned earlier, personal hemp smoking kits like this one are among the grave goods of Scythian men and women buried in Kurgans. Amazon clothing and weapons are some of the most striking changes for accuracy in Greek art. The earliest images of Amazons appeared on vase paintings about 2,500 years ago. And those earliest, most ancient scenes show the women dressed and armed or 
in the costume of heroic nudity, as it's called. They were dressed like Greek hoplite warriors. They're wearing Greek helmets, armor, round shields, and they're fighting on foot with swords. The Greeks just uh, portrayed them as uh, counterparts of their own heroes. But soon, as they got more and more information about the Scythians, the Greek artists began showing the foreign Amazons with Scythian-style clothing and weapons, and they showed them on horseback. And we can even see two types of horses on the vase paintings. Some Amazons ride tall, lean horses. Akal Teki is the, is the name now for those horses. They were bred for speed in the desert. And they also rode small, sturdy step ponies. Both of those types of horses correspond to the two types of horses that are found in Scythian graves. Some of them are actually mummified by the, by the permafrost and dry conditions, as in these examples. Scythian riders rode bareback. They didn't have stirrups. They had light or no reins at all. They guided their horses with their thighs, knees, and feet and voice commands, and many Greek vases and sculptures depict Amazons riding barefooted with heel and ankle guards against chafing. And this detailed vase painting shows an Amazon tying on ankle guards or spurs. Greek artists began to equip the Amazons with real Scythian weapons, just like those found in Scythian burials. Amazons were now shown as archers, and they were outfitted with distinctive um, Scythian-style recurve bows and decorated quivers with flaps that hung on belts at their waist instead of at the back of their shoulders. And here's another very interesting, realistic Scythian cultural detail of Scythian-style archery. It's overlooked by the art historians. When I showed vase paintings of Amazon archers to some archery experts, they immediately noted that the women are using the nomad style thumb draw and also instinctive archery with no fixed anchor. The thumb draw is sometimes called the Mongolian draw. They were using those uh, techniques with their, bow, their small bows instead of the Mediterranean release used by the Greek archers using uh, uh, their bows in vase paintings. You can see an example of that in the upper left. And as we've already seen, Greek artists illustrated Amazons twisting around on their horses to shoot arrows backwards in the notorious Parthian shot. That recurve bow used by Scythian archers was an equalizer, as I mentioned, for women. And the bow's curves store a lot of extra force under compression because of those curves. And that makes it very difficult, impossible to string, unless you know the trick. Instead of brute physical strength, one has to learn the special technique. To attach the string, you have to brace the bow under your knee while while you're sitting or kneeling. And there are images on ancient coins, as you can see above on the left, uh, and on vases, showing Amazons and Scythians, but especially interesting that they show Amazons stringing their bows using this special Scythian technique. It can also be done standing if you brace one foot against a rock or a helmet, as shown on this vase from the Smithsonian on the right. Now, some Greek images of Amazon archers have been misunderstood by scholars until now. For example, there's a vase painting here shows an Amazon archer between two riders, one of them identified as a Scythian, the other one is Greek. The archer is bending very far backwards, seemingly aiming randomly at the sky. The ancient vase specialists and art historians have interpreted this scene as, quote, a dying Amazon collapsing in battle. But in fact, the archer's stance is an accurate portrayal of flight archery, shooting an arrow a very long distance. The Greek and the Scythian on the horses appear to be observers of a flight archery contest. And flight archery contests were described by ancient Greek historians. and. We even have some of the, uh, uh, the record 
distances recorded on an ancient inscription on the Black Sea. The Scythians were famous for their accuracy and their long distance shooting. Amazons were shown on Greek vases holding more than one arrow while drawing their bows. That sometimes puzzled art scholars. They, they thought it might be a mistake by a careless vase painter. But instead of a mistake, those images depict the proper technique for speed shooting arrows. It allows an archer to shoot in quick succession without having to constantly reach for arrows from the quiver at their waist. Scythian archers were also famous for their speed shooting, and they could probably, estimate estimates today are that they could probably release an arrow every one to three seconds. They would be daunting enemies. Besides bows and arrows, Amazons were often shown with swords, battle axes, and a pair of spears, the typical weapons that are found in Scythian burials of men and women as in these examples from face paintings and one mosaic there. And this is a rather famous face painting using all, uh, the, all of the weapons at hand. A unique and beautiful face painting in the Metropolitan Museum in New York shows an Amazon taking aim with a sling. Her two spears, you can notice, are stuck in the ground on the left. According to slinging experts that I've talked to, her stance is quite accurate. Piles of sling pebbles have been found among the weapons buried with Scythian women in their kurgans. Several ancient Greek writers described steppe warrior women's skills with the lasso, and they told how they used them to rope their enemies in battle and then finish them off with battle axes. So I was pretty delighted when I came across this rare vase painting of an Amazon on horseback twirling a lariat, just like Wonder Woman's golden lasso. That Amazon there is charging toward a Greek warrior. You can't see him, but he is cowering underneath his shield, decorated with a snake there in the upper right. This action scene decorated a Greek woman's jewelry or cosmetic box. Uh, a lot of women's objects contained images of Amazons. This Amazon is wearing a patterned tunic and leggings, as you can see, and the kind of sensible, practical action wear invented by the nomads whose lives centered on horses. And the wild patterns and textures of the leggings and sleeves worn by Amazons in Greek vase paintings match the textiles and garments that have been recovered from Scythian graves. Amazons in the vase paintings are shown in long sleeve shirts and trousers decorated with geometric designs and sometimes even griffins, lions, and deer, as in the upper right. They wear high leather boots, if they're not barefooted, and soft pointed caps with ear flaps and spotted leopard skins. And all of those items are found in the burials of Scythians. These are some uh, artist reconstructions of warrior women's garments from uh, clothing that was found in Scythian kurgans. The Greeks were fascinated and appalled by Amazon's trousers. That's something no Greek man or woman would ever be caught dead in. Greeks wore simple rectangles of cloth held in place with pins like most people around the Mediterranean. Trousers, as I mentioned, were tailored. They were stitched together from fitted pieces. And who invented trousers? According to the Greeks, it was the Amazons. And in fact, trousers were, as I mentioned, invented by the men and women who first began riding horses. These are some of the, um, some pictures of clothing that has been found in Scythian graves. And you can see uh, uh, the patterns, um, decorations, uh, look very similar to what is portrayed on Amazons in Greek vase paintings. The earliest pair of trousers were found preserved in Scythian graves from nearly 3,000 years ago. I think I mentioned that. Trousers were not just 
sensible and practical. They were necessary for a life on horseback. And they were equalizers. I think I have time for one more example of an ancient artifact that demonstrates how Greek artists incorporated realistic features of Scythian culture and life in illustrations of Amazons. This beautiful golden ring was made in about 425 BC, classical Greece. You can see it on display in the Museum of Fine Arts here in Boston. The full significance of the scene has eluded understanding until now. At the Boston Museum, the museum text says, it shows an Amazon on a horse with her dog hunting a deer. The Amazon is wearing a belted tunic, as you can see. Her hair and the cape or cloak are blowing back to indicate speed and actions. She has the reins choked up tight to control the spirited horse as she is about to spear the deer with her javelin. And the deer on this tiny ring is so exquisitely detailed that we can even determine the species. It's a spotted fallow buck with, they have broad palmate antlers. Her hunting dog is a type of sight hound, still used in Central Asia today. And it's attacking from the rear. You can see that the deer's left hind leg, or I think it's the left, left hind, hind leg is broken. And what about the large bird? What, why is that included in the scene? The scholars just ignored, ignored that detail. But I was looking at photographs of traditional hunters on horseback in Kazakhstan and Mongolia when I suddenly realized the significance of that bird on the, on the ring in the Museum of Fine Arts. This is Makpal Abrakova of Kazakhstan. She's an eagle hunter. Falconry, training raptors to hunt, has very ancient roots among the steppe nomads. I learned about a discovery in Central Asia of a fully clothed mummy of a horsewoman in the Tarim Basin area. Who, she lived when this ring uh, that I showed you was being made in Greece, and she was buried with a huge leather mitt on one hand, just like the one on this modern female falconer's arm. I also learned that the bird perched on, on the arm is a golden eagle, and that is the favorite bird of prey to train for traditional hunting on the steppes by the nomads. They hunt rabbits, deer, foxes, and even wolves with golden eagles. There are a few more young women who are uh, eagle hunters or apprentices learning the traditional skill again. So that bird hovering above the deer's head is not just a random decoration, as assumed by the scholars. It's an eagle with a hooked beak spread wings and tail, it's about to attack the deer. So this stunning golden ring illustrates an Amazon eagle hunter on horseback accompanied by a sight hound. All four, the Amazon, the dog, the horse, and the eagle are focused on the prize. By training these three animals, the nomads made the harsh, unforgiving steps into a land rich with accessible game. The scene on the ring is compelling evidence that the classical Greeks had heard about or maybe even observed horsewomen of eastern lands who trained eagles to hunt. Amazon figures may have served many symbolic functions for the Greeks, but archaeology now proves that warrior women were not merely figments of the Greek imagination. And the many examples of naturalistic details and ethnographic features in ancient artworks provide very strong evidence that the Greek images and ideas of Amazons were certainly influenced by real nomadic horse people. The Greeks interwove threads of fact with imaginative storytelling to create a panoramic world of Amazons. It seems Fair to say that Amazons as a dream and as a reality have always existed. Sometimes they're hidden or suppressed, but at other times the Amazons among us come blazing into popular culture and history. And there are strong signs that a powerful Amazon spirit may be awakening today. And as the ancient Scythians would tell us, 
that just makes good sense. Thank you. Happy to take questions if anyone has one. So, so you explained how popular uh, the Scythians and the Amazons were with the Greeks. Did the Greeks attempt to adapt any of the horse riding or the trousers or the roles of women in their fighting? No. Or, no. Okay. So, <laughs> but did they notice that it was successful, or they said that's just not for us? The, uh, the Greeks had such a strong aversion to covering the arms and legs. They thought that was just an outrageous and barbaric style of dressing. Okay. And they, um, they often mocked the Persians for the Persians actually did adopt the Scythian uh, way of dressing because they became horse people. Um, they copied the Parthians and the, and the other um, Scythian tribes. And the Greeks mocked the Persians for wearing these effeminate styles, uh, cover, leg, leg coverings and sleeves. Uh, a, a manly man wore a, a mini skirt. <laughs> and it's interesting that the Xenophon wrote a manual on, on a horsemanship for the Greeks. And he does not, he's a horse rider. He does not, he's in the, in the fifth century BC, and he does not recommend that Greek men wear trousers to ride horses. He, but he does say, make sure that you arrange your cloak under you so that you do not, especially when you're getting onto the horse, so that you do not present a shocking spectacle as you mount your horse. So even, even though, even a horse, horsemanship manual could not bring itself to recommend trousers. Um. <laughs> um, excuse me, did you uh, come across any evidence in your research that the, the Scythian tribes were either matriarchal or matrilineal? Or was it simply equal opportunity and it is the female leaders that we've heard about uh, as I mentioned, the Scythians didn't leave any history, so we have to go by what their neighbors said and the archaeology, and then also look at, you, you can do comparative ethnography by looking at people who are following a Scythian style of life on the steppes in modern times, you can, you can compare. So we don't have any evidence of matriarchal societies across the steppes. What we have is evidence of equal opportunity, as you said. Um, in that kind of lifestyle, women could give counsel in uh, making decisions. And of course, they rose to leadership uh, positions because we have actually documented by the neighbors that there were women leading armies against uh, Persians, against Egyptians, against Chinese. Um, so, so we know that they did have equal opportunity in, lead, in leadership. Um, we don't have any evidence for matriarchy. Um, I guess my question is slightly related. Um, OK, so the Greek girls have are dolls of Amazons. The Greek women have icons of Amazons. Is there any correlation between, I mean, the way the Greeks treated women was terrible, but it wasn't uniformly terrible. So is there any correlation between how women were treated in different city-states in different periods with the popularity of the artifacts among the girls? The popularity of the, of the Amazon images on women's perfume bottles, on their jewelry boxes, on some of their items for sewing and weaving, um, I think that really points to a mystery about Greek life that we don't really, we, we can't explain. I mean, Amazons were also a popular, very popular image on crockery that we know was in a shape that was given to newlyweds. Why would you give newlyweds pictures of Amazons? There's something going on there that, that we don't know. It's really very interesting. I mean, I know a lot of feminists like to say, okay, Wonder Woman's going to be a great icon for girls to empower them and give, and, and I'm just wondering, did that happen? Um, according to most scholars, uh, classicists have argued and maintained that all of these 
images of Amazons were like domestic propaganda to discourage girls from taking up archery, horseback riding, and asking for equality. But the fact that the images are so popular among girls and women, and it shows them in such a powerful way, I don't think that that argument has any traction anymore. So. Yes? Um, I have a bio archaeology question. So my question is, has anybody examined the bodies of the uh, people whose tombs you talked about and seen if there's asymmetrical development on, uh, on the long bones of the upper body? Um, because I think we would expect with archers to find one side more developed than the other. And it would be a way of determining who got these grave goods because of their occupation and who got it because of their social status or their life cycle. Um, for one thing, uh, the modern um, mounted archers that I have spoken to, the ones who are using the instinctive archery technique, and especially the Parthian shot, they shoot both sides, they can shoot with both arms. Um, they can just switch. Uh, so we know that these nomads on the steppes were practicing archery since they were kid, little kids. So I don't think we would see that. But I did mention, uh, I didn't uh, call it out, but I did mention that they have found differences in hand bones of the women that have sh one hand might show heavy use of a bow, consistent with heavy use of a bow. So I think that's uh, the kind of evidence you're looking for. Um, edit. Well, somewhat similar question. So the the name Amazon comes from Amazos, which is you know this myth that Amazon women would remove the breast so they could shoot arrows better. Now, is there any evidence of that? <laughs> no. Or, okay. No. That, was that but a, that, was that idea at that time, sticks or is that a new like one? glue. It's just like super glue. Is that a modern Both idea, or did that trace all the way back to the Greeks? It's so it's such an interesting idea, wrong idea that I devoted an entire chapter to Amazon breasts. Um, <laughs> so quickly, the, the name has absolutely nothing to do with breasts. It's not a Greek word. The Greeks borrowed the word Amazones, and, and no one knows where it came from. The, most linguists believe that it might be an ancient Iranian word that it derives from Hamazon, which simply means warrior. So that makes a lot of sense. Um, uh, but the Greeks had a, uh, an obsession with making non-Greek words in their language into Greek words for patriotic reasons. So there was an etymologist in the fifth century BC. He was actually a historian dabbling in etymology. And he said, well, let's figure out what th this must be a Greek word. And so it sounds a little bit like a, a, a mazos, which in Greek would sound a little bit like without a mazos breast. But he was immediately challenged by other historians of his day who said, that's ridiculous, of course not. Not one, not, there is not one ancient representation of an Amazon with only one breast. Um, and as, I mean, if you've watched The Hunger Games or you looked at any of the pictures I was showing, it is physiologically ridiculous. So, uh, and yet the idea just won't go away. It's the one thing everyone knows about Amazons. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah. This is fascinating, the combination of the archaeological evidence and the documentary evidence, the imagery and so on. So you've mastered like art history and archaeology <laughs> and Greek sources. But I'm going to ask you if you've also looked at Hittite and Persian and so on sources and if they say anything or if there's evidence that they they need to be re-read in the light of what you've you found. I haven't looked at Hittite sources, but um, there is a chapter on Persian uh, stories about Amazons in my book. Um, the Persians did tell stories about about steppe nomad women, and we have them. They're preserved for us because of the Greeks who went to Persia and preserved and recorded the stories told by the Persians. Uh, there was a Greek doctor named Ctesias who served as a, a physician for the Persian king. He wrote a book uh, about Persian stories about steppe mm -hmm. nomads. So we have his, his reports, and we have the names of, of many uh, steppe nomad warrior queens who fought Persians, and we have their stories. Um, 
so yes, the uh, other cultures bordering Scythia who encountered steppe nomads definitely had stories about warrior women, Amazon-like women. The, uh, there was a, um, a papyrus found recently and then even more recently has been finally translated and it, it's in tatters, but you've got enough of the story to see that the title is The Egyptians and the Amazons and it's about an uh, Egyptian prince who goes out to fight an Amazon queen and her warriors. So many, many other ancient cultures told stories about warrior women. Thank you. Yeah. At what point do the Amazons start vanishing from the historical record? Because um, <clears throat> I, I, I know the bow eventually turns up in Mongolia and is used by the Mongol, the Mongol horde to devastating effect against the, the Chinese and, and much of Europe at that point. Yes. Um, but, and the Mongol women also shot. Yes. Um, so, but at what point do the Amazons sort of disappear from the record? It's interesting that um, as you read the, the ancient Greek and then the Latin Roman sources, they tell us an exciting story about historical uh, warrior queens who are from Scythia. And then they say, and then with her death, the Amazons disappeared. And then the next writer that you read says, but there were pockets of them, and well, there were vestiges there. And they keep reappearing. So I think, uh, I don't think there's any end point. As you say, the, uh, the Mo there's a book called The Secret History of the Mongol Queens that is uh, about Genghis Khan's granddaughters saving his empire. And, um, uh, the story, I, I, my last chapter is on China, and we have Chinese chronicles about warrior women from those steppe tribes. What's really interesting is all of these other groups from antiquity who tell about Amazon-like women, a radically different script for the stories. They want them as lovers, as allies, whereas the Greeks kill them all. I mean, the, the, all the, the Greek mythic script dooms them to death, whereas all these other cultures say, no, we, we want them on our side. Um, so I don't, I don't think there's any uh, historical end point unless you get to the Arab conquest and then the Islamic era. When, but even then, there are stories in the Middle Ages about women who go to war. And it goes all the way up through the Middle Ages. And now it's back. Okay, thank you.